Welcome back. In the last video we talked about endotherms and ectotherms and we named some of the responses to the rise or the fall in temperature and explained how those responses help them regulate temperature. In this video we're going to cover the next dot point which is quite similar. In this video and in this dot point we're going to cover Australian ectotherms and endotherms. I'll read the actual dot point. It says, analyze information from secondary sources to describe adaptations and responses that have occurred in Australian organisms to assist temperature regulation. So the verb itself is describe. So we have to describe adaptations and responses that have occurred in Australian, the specific word Australian organisms that assist in temperature regulation. Now I'm going to go over um, again what an adaptation is in a second. But before I start, I'll go over those two terms again, endotherms and ectotherms. An endotherm is something that can maintain its internal environment. So endo means inside, and therm means temperature. So an endotherm is something that can keep its inside temperature, its body temperature, constant by itself. Its body can do this. Whereas on the other side, ectotherms, Ectos means outside, and therm means temperature. So a ectotherm is an organism or an animal or a plant that cannot keep its internal temperature constant by itself. It needs to use the outside, so it's the outside environment, to do that. So whatever the ambient temperature, whatever the outside temperature is, is also its internal temperature. Now just to um, kind of hone down that point, I've used an analogy. I'm going to show you an analogy now so you can sort of visualize that a bit more. So I've got two people, person A, who's meant to be my endotherm, and person B, who's meant to be my ectotherm. Now person A has bought a very nice aircon. So he basically, he, it might be in a 45 degrees outside, and with no aid, with no aircon, with no fan, it might even be more hot inside, so it might be 50 degrees Celsius inside. So both person A and person B would like to have some way to be able to bring that temperature down, so 50 degrees inside is pretty hot. So person A will use his aircon, so he'll set his aircon, he'll use a remote and set it at maybe 20 degrees Celsius, and the aircon will do that job for it. It will bring it down from 50, to 20. So person A is happy because he can be inside his home and it'll be 20 degrees Celsius even though the outside temperature is 50 degrees um, or 45 outside but the inside is 20 degrees because he's got the aircon to do that for him. Now person B is a bit less lucky. He couldn't afford or he doesn't have an aircon and he has no fan either. So he's got no fan or aircon, he has no way to keep his inside home environment at a normal level. So in his case, he's got a couple options. And all his options kind of involve stepping out of the house to cool down. So for person B, the ectotherm person, he might, if he's lucky, he might have a pool. So he might jump into the pool, which is usually colder, to bring to have a normal temperature. So he might jump into the pool. And that pool is the outside environment. So he's using the outside environment to control his temperature because he doesn't have an air or a fan. Or if he doesn't have a pool, he might go to the beach. And again, the beach is obviously a good place to cool down as well because the ocean is quite cold compared to the um, air. So the beach might also, again, jump into the beach. And that's why you know beach and pools are often a very nice alternative when it comes to the hot days. Especially in Australia, you can have really hot days in summer. So that person A was the endotherm. He can control his inside temperature by himself. He can just have his aircon set at 20 degrees Celsius, and that'll do it for him. Whereas the ectotherm doesn't have that luxury. He's got no aircon or no fan. So they have to use a pool or the beach or whatever else to cool down. And that's the same with endotherms and ectotherms. Endotherms, we, we as a mammal can do that with our sweating and everything else, so it's always going to be constant. Whereas an ectotherm, reptiles, um, bird, no, reptiles, fish, amphibians, they have to use their environment, only their environment, to keep it constant. And don't forget, the person A, if he wanted to, I mean, he can use the aircon, but if he wanted to, he'd also jump into the beach or jump into the 
pool. So person A has two options. He can use the environment or he can use his internal or he can use both. Whereas person B only has that other option, one option. Now the one negative is just with same with the aircon. Aircon costs a lot of energy or of, of en electricity. The same with keeping our inside constant. This is this, the equation for cellular respiration, the same equation that came in the intro, the music intro. So glucose plus oxygen, that makes ATP and also produces water and CO2 as a byproduct. This ATP is used for energy, but for endotherms, they can do something else as well. They can actually also, if they wanted to, they could produce heat. So instead of producing ATP, they can use that glucose or food, so glucose is the food, they can use that food to produce heat instead. And that heat helps them to keep it in a constant internal environment. So now that that's the reason the problem with that is this is for example a mouse. A mouse is a mammal. And a mammal is something that is an endotherm. So an, an endotherm will use lots of glucose, lots of food that it actually gets to produce heat. And that's why this mouse will eat as much or more than this snake. So this snake is the ectotherm. The snake is an, a reptile. So the snake doesn't have to use its food for heat, whereas the mammal uses its food for heat. So the, the mouse eats just as much or more, same food or more, as a snake, even though the mouse is much smaller. That's because because to keep its internal constant environment the same with that aircon kind of technology, which the mouse also has with its own circulation, it has to use its food to make not only ATP, so energy, but also make heat as well. So that was just a quick rundown again of what an endotherm and what an ectotherm was, and to give you a quick analogy as well. And now going to the actual example. So we've got two examples. We've got our endotherms and our ectotherms. So this is mentioned, we have to name Australian examples. And these are both Australian examples. I've got the koala for our endotherm. I've got the crocodilus johnstoni for our ectotherm. And as you can probably tell, that's a crocodile. Australian crocodile. Now it also says we need to describe adaptations and responses. Now adaptations, remember from year 11 as well, there's three different types of ad adaptations. Structural, physiological, and behavioral. Now structural is just, for example, fur. That's just a structure we have, or a, a koala in this case has. That's a structural adaptation. Something that helps it to deal with its environment. Behavioral ad adaptation would be jumping into the pool. Um, seeking shade, bask in the sun, uh, seeking shelter, all that would be behavioral, that's what we, our behavior does that. And physiological, that's the aircon. So physiological is what our, inside our body, what that does to, to maintain a constant internal environment. So physiological, these are the ones which most of the endotherms do, and ectotherms don't do that much of it. But I'll go over a couple of the examples, and I'll mention, are they used if it's too cold, or are they used if it's too warm? So for the endotherm, I, we use the example of the koala. And there's actually two koalas here. And the reason why is because one comes from Queensland and one comes from Victoria. For any non-Australian viewers, this is the map of Australia. Victoria is somewhere here. And I drew a blue dot because um, Victoria is actually quite a bit colder than Queensland. Queensland is somewhere around here. Now these are two koalas, but they're actually different species. And what you can tell, their fur is a bit different. This has a lighter fur, and this one has thicker fur. This one is the one which comes from the blue dot. So this one comes from, I'm going to draw a blue dot on his chest. This one comes from Victoria, in the cold area, or the colder area. And this one comes from Queensland. That looks like a, um, that one comes from Queensland. Uh, Queensland. That comes Queensland and that's a hotter area. So you can see that fur is different and the reason why is because you want to have more fur if it's cold than if it's hot because fur is a structural adaptation that allows you to deal with coldness mostly. So for the actual Victorian one it has a thicker fur to allow it to deal with that cold temperature. So that is for dealing with cold temperatures. I'm going to do a blue dot. The blue dot means also means cold temperatures. 
for dealing with cold and red de is dealing with warm temperatures or if it's too warm. Nocturnal behavior, a koala will only actually be awake for about four hours. It'll sleep for about 20 hours a day. And those four hours are usually always spent hunting during the night. The reason why is because during the night it's going to be a bit colder. If it's too warm outside, it wants to be able to not hunt during the day because that would be too bad for it. So it's going to hunt only during the night. So I drew a red circle because nocturnal behavior is used if it's too warm outside because it's going to be less heat lost if they're hunting during the night because it's colder during the night. Now these are endotherms, so nocturnal behavior is an example of a behavioral adaption. The blood vessels is constricting, that's when your blood vessels become smaller and that's to help heat loss. So this happens when it's too cold outside, their blood vessels constrict to help them prevent to lose more heat and that's a physiological adaptation. So this is one thing that happens in their body which ectotherms often can't do. It can also shiver also when it's too cold. This is again a physiological adaptation because the insides of the body is making this happen. Shivering when it's too cold, that will mean that um, you have more muscle activity when, it's, when you shiver and you produce more body heat. So shivering is useful when it's too cold because that will increase your body heat. Blood vessels dilate. This is blood vessels dilate is the opposite of blood vessels constricting. So when it's getting too warm outside, you want to make sure you lose more body heat. So I'm going to draw a red circle because blood vessels dilate means that we lose more body temperature, more body heat, which is good because if it's too hot outside, we want to make sure we keep it at a lower temperature. And um, just like humans, koalas can also do that as well. And evaporative cooling. That's similar to just sweating, but it's not quite the same. That's actually water from their mouth actually evaporates. That cools them. And that happens when it's too warm outside. I should have actually drawn a red arrow, a red circle. When it's too warm outside, there's going to be evaporative cooling, which cools them down again. And that's also a physiological adaptation. Now we've got the crocodilus Johnstoni. That's your freshwater crocodile often found in Queensland, fresh water crocodile. Its adaptations are that it seeks shelter when in, in water. This is usually actually when it's too cold outside. So when it's too cold outside, it will seek shelter in water. And the reason why is because the water would have been warmed up during the night, during the day, sorry, and then the water itself can cool these crocodiles back down again. So they seek shelter in water. This often happens at night when it's too cold. So at night when it's too cold, these crocodiles will go into the water and that will cool them down. They'll also bask in the sun. They'll do this when it's too cold outside as well. So when it's too cold outside, they'll make sure they get as much sunlight as possible to bring their temperature back up. It'll also seek, sh seek shade. This happens when it's too warm. So I'll draw a red for too warm. And by going to shade, they'll obviously get less sun and, and less heating as well. They're less active during the night. So this happens when it's too cold. They want to make sure they spare their energy. If they're hunting during the day, that's better for them than hunting at night. And they also open their mouth. And one of the, I'm, we're guessing one of the reasons why they open their mouth is for and the water which is in the mouth to evaporate. So that happens when it's too warm outside, evaporation. Not for the body doing anything, but them just opening their mouth and then having their saliva evaporate. So these are some of the adaptions. And as you can see, most of these adaptions for the crocodile are behavioral adaptions. Whereas for the endotherms, we've got behavioral, physiological, and structural. And physiological, we've got quite a few of those. Blood vessels dilating, evaporating, um, of water shivering, blood vessels constricting, all of these are all the physiological ones. And that's because an endotherm can maintain its own body temperature, whereas an ectotherm has to use the environment to do that. So you can either use, when it comes to this dot point, you can use this example of the koala and the crocodilus johnstoni, or you can use the last two examples from the last video, the red kangaroo and the blue tongue lizard. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.